That base case everyone's factoring in now will be wrong. The, the low rate environment forever, um, that will be proven to be wrong and that will cause big shocks for the stock market. We're looking more at the growth commodities, so oil, we're looking at nickel, we're looking, we remain positive on copper. A lot of the beneficiaries over the last 12 months, how do they cycle, how do they comp those numbers over the next 12 or 24 months? I think the QE is a mistake though. It's at the end of the lockdown period, our economy was reopening, you've got a vaccine coming now. So I think the QE will distort some of the market prices in Australia. Value could become the next growth as the cyclical recovery starts to take shape. Tech sector looks overvalued. Um, I mean, that's a standout still. Um, prices could fall 30, 40% and I wouldn't be surprised um, if we go into this next phase. Things don't happen that quickly. And by human nature, we like to go back to what we know. So as soon as borders open up and as soon as people are able to dine out and travel again, you will see that in earnest. Guys, it's a really interesting time to be having a chat. There's been um, you know, a huge amount of stimulus in the market. We've also had some news that's caused a reaction around the, the prospect of a, a vaccine. Matt, when we were talking just before we got started today, you talked about common sense starting to return to the market. What does that mean? What is that common sense that's coming in? Well, James, I really think it's around you know, the unprecedented a response to monetary supply, you know, sending rates down to zero, negative. You had all the long duration assets just bid up, um, pulling forward expected returns to today, and the valuations were getting out of control. Um, what you're seeing now is some hope of some normality coming back into the market. So you're getting some rates moving up, a vaccine may cause monetary policy to be eased in the future, and all those expected returns will be um, diminished over time. Um, because it's very sensitive at the moment because the rates are so low and you've got you know, probably their sweet spot at the moment while economies are shut down, any change to those dynamics causes a massive impact. Yeah. What have been some of the impacts of all of this you know, money that's flowing through the system and particularly in the market where you guys are investing, like where is it, where is it going, where is this flow of money headed? Yeah, I guess it's really around those long duration assets, infrastructure, anything with interest rate sensitivity. Um, but as we know, uh, monetary policy doesn't really fix the economy, it just boosts asset prices. So we've seen that at the moment. Anything to do with you know, duration or interest rate sensitivity, they've gone up a lot. But it really hasn't helped the economy as we've found over time. Monetary policy doesn't help the economy, economy fiscal policy does. The other thing to note is that over the last six months, markets have been very dislocated. We've had a lot of volatility, but that's created a lot of opportunity. So what we've seen is that for a period of three to six years, there was a one directional market where people were just buying long duration tech just to kind of get to generate earnings and returns. Today, we have more opportunities in the market. There's more dislocation. So from that standpoint, from a day to day basis, we're more excited because we're, there's more opportunities to make money for our shareholders. So we're going to definitely dig into some of the, the opportunities in a second, but just while we're on the, the bigger picture story. Um, the RBA has lowered rates again um, quite recently and announced um, you know, our own QE program. Um, what's your take on, 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 on that decision and, and the impact that it has, particularly in the large cap space? Yeah, I think the RBA move initially was very good. They were very quick to respond to the um, pandemic. Uh, lowering rates, you know, the, the, the funding for the banks was great. I think the QE is a mistake though. It's at the end of the lockdown period, our economy was reopening, you've got a vaccine coming now. So I think the QE will distort some of the market prices in Australia. Um, it's very good for property and the like, but I really think it's boring on a policy error. They've gone too late, they should have gone much earlier, and holding down yield curve control uh, hurts financial companies. Um, but it's quite interesting that the market interpreted the QE announcement from the RBA probably in the way the RBA didn't want um, things to happen. The dollar shot up, the long end of the yield curve shot up because I think the market's looking at this response as being too late and now it's actually going against what the RBA were trying to deliver which was lowering the Aussie dollar. So policy is too late, should have been earlier and I think it could cause some areas um, of concern around some of the valuations in Australia as well. So the, the thing to remember is Australia is ahead of the rest of the world from a recovery phase. We're almost already out of the corona phase and, the, and with the vaccine coming to the rest of the world, we've been able to manage and mitigate a lot of the risks a lot earlier. 
as Matt said, the RBA and policymakers in Australia were ahead of the curve early on uh, with JobKeeper and JobSeeker and stimulus and whatever else was required, but they're doubling down at the wrong time. And so by doubling down at the wrong time, probably backs us up a little bit compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, interesting. Um, maybe we could just have a, a quick chat about um, a, a recap from the conversation we had from May. Um, you guys were being very active in the market, um, trading opportunities, and, and you sort of talked about um, sort of being chained to your desks. Some of the themes that at the time were, were really, um, you, you were bullish on banks, you'd um, talked about having, having held some gold, um, you saw an opportunity in oil. I was wondering if you could maybe give me a, a recap on some of the views and how the portfolio has evolved and, and what's worked for you over the past six months. The, big, the biggest thing we focused on was the sequencing of the recovery. So from a portfolio construction standpoint, we tried to position ourselves from a sequencing standpoint, who's gonna come out first, second, third, and then we constructed the portfolio with that backdrop. So if you consider, as Matt would have said in May, we were very positive around China being the first ones out of the coronavirus and the recovery phase. So we're very heavily positioned to resources at that, at that time. Following that, we decided we decide to tilt the portfolio to banks as a lot more of the domestic cyclicals because we thought Australia would be the next country to come out of it. So you, you kind of, from a flow perspective, we just started to, our money would flow from China to Australia to other markets where we thought the recovery would be taking shape. Um, you didn't mention the technology sector, which was has been a, a huge beneficiary. Um, I know you've alluded to some um, lofty valuations. How have you managed not having exposure to technology and why haven't you had that exposure? I, I really think it's valuation for us. We just struggle um, trying to comprehend the market caps of these companies. Obviously the conditions are right for them to go up. Um, how we managed is by picking companies, which John alluded to, we, we look at the phases of this recovery um, and we were quite early on the recovery phase with, domestically and companies like Star Group, SCG and a few of those um, more, they're, they're at depressed levels like trading below NTAs and um, you know, people were thinking balance sheets were at risk and we never thought that was the case because of the controls within Australia. So, I mean, that's how we've kept up by picking these really depressed companies that are actually generating good cash flow. Um, and have good asset backing. So I, th I think the real important thing now is we're entering a different phase of the market. We were in, in the recovery phase now. Now with the potential vaccine, we are gonna to have to look forward to how this economic output gap closes and that will benefit real companies. So we're looking for, towards those. So maybe can we dig into some more specifics? I'd love to hear about what's in the portfolio now. You talked about sequencing you know, the phase of the recovery. So that's a bit of a retrospective. Talk me through um, what's in now and, and how you're thinking about playing the next phase of this recovery. Well, well, really the next phase is moving, like I touched on, closing the output gap in the economy. So you've got potential G GDP sitting way higher and you've got this huge output gap. So we really need to close that output gap. And that closing of the output gap is consumer spending and also economic activity. So as that returns, You've got to be leveraged to those companies. And for us, that's, a, that's where we really um, do well in that environment because we're looking at these companies making good cash flow. Um, balance sheets will be rewarded finally. They were punished before, um, but good balance sheets will be rewarded in this environment. And you've got to be positioned for anything linked to economic activity or recovery. So um, in, in the area for us at the moment, things that stand out, um, is in insurance sector again that's very much out of favour at the moment but that is a sector that will benefit from you know rising yields but also the premium cycle is incredibly hard at the moment and it's been ignored and anything paying a dividend as well dividend payers have been punished in this environment which is quite bizarre um, they will be the next beneficiaries as well so you've got to find companies with good dividends because um, they will be the next beneficiaries so the insurance names are iag and qbe but other aspects that we like to focus on is what the company's exposed to government spend. So stocks like Lendlease and uh, Down or conti should continue to do well over the next 12 to 24 months. Elsewhere, what Corona and COVID has provided is an opportunity for companies to re, uh, refocus on their cost base, reposition and restructure. So as what we're gonna see when we come out the other side is more profitability in corporate Australia. So if you take Qantas for an example, what they were able to achieve during Corona, they wouldn't have been able to achieve previously. 
so they were able to readdress their cost base and as you come out the other side, their domestic earnings will probably be greater than their, their, their peak earnings for the group in totality from 2018. So we're very positive around corporate Australia that, that have been able to restructure their, their, their cost base and refocus on growth in the future. You've mentioned a few stocks there. I'd love it if one of you, I don't mind too, could just take me a little bit deeper inside a, a really core position, something where you've got a lot of conviction about how you want to play. You think it's a good example of some of those things that you've talked about and maybe just take me a little bit deeper inside the thesis. Well, what I can touch on is IAG, of the insurance company. So IAG, there is a great debate around the exposure with business insurance. So again, what we like to do um, is find companies where the market has got an opinion and then we try to find the opposite um, and work through that. So we've worked through it quite often uh, with different analysts, um, also lawyers and talking about business insurance and we think the market's um, impact or the perceived impact will be a lot less than um, you know the, what they perceive. So we think the IAG's exposure will be much, much less and the market's sort of factoring over a billion, a billion and a half, which we think is very wrong. So IAG is a specific example of a company uh, during the pandemic, there was all this, um, you know, liability, which could be a lot of people thinking unlimited, but we think it's very much contained. So um, that is a company that has been caught up in the hype around the pandemic. So that is a, a very specific case. Um, but also you've got the potential of interest rates rising, which is a small portion of their earnings. But the real key is the um, premium cycle is incredibly hard. So you've got tailwinds coming out of this. And once BI is released, we think there'll be an incredible upside for this company. Yeah. Um, materials has been a, a sector that's held up pretty well. Uh, there's been some strength in commodity prices. John, you mentioned China came out early. It's been um, supportive for that, for that part of the market. How have you guys played the materials sector? And is it, is it a core part of the portfolio now? It remains, it remains an overweight, a key, a key sector. So for, for the last two, three years, uh, bulks, so BHP, Fortescue, Rio, have been the main driver of our material overweight. Uh, and they've, done, they've been massive beneficiaries from China stimulus, uh, supply shocks from uh, Brazil. But as we sit here today, a lot of that has taken shape and taken place. So we're looking more at the growth commodities. So oil, we're looking at nickel, we're looking, we remain positive on copper. So we're starting to rotate away slightly from the bulks and starting to look more towards the base metals inside the, the, the oil stocks. Uh, as we think as recovery takes shape, they should be well positioned uh, looking forward. And is there a, 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 a core or a lead position that sort of explains that rotation or that you can use as a case for that rotation? Uh, I mean, the, the most obvious one for us has been Oz Minerals. So um, again, um, there was some company specific um, um, things, which was the company was upgrading its um, production and uh, the capex was very much on target for their, their expansion, which was uh, under question for a period. But it's really around uh, the coronavirus knocking out a lot of the copper output um, in South America. So that was a beneficiary that we played and we've been riding into this recovery phase. So uh, for us, copper, like John said, um, very much activity-led um, commodity. And we think in the next phase, it, we will position to do well. Um, we've talked uh, a lot about sort of the, the core parts of the portfolio. I know you guys have a tactical way of thinking about the market as well. How is that balance between core and the, the tactical trading opportunities sitting at the moment? And, and what, where are some of the opportunities that, that you guys are thinking about from that shorter term um, trading perspective? The market provided a lot of opportunities recently. And as Matt pointed out, that you know, and you mentioned earlier that we were glued to our desk for a long period of time during the last six months. And people react in certain ways to information. What our job is to do is to process this information and work out if it's an overreaction, long or short. So if people have got a bit too aggressive on a stock and we own it, we've got to capitalise on those opportunities one way or another. Um, and where we sit today, it's just a function of opportunities in the market. So we've been presented with a lot more structural core positions within the portfolio over, over the recent past. But uh, as we look forward, we're probably going to have to start to look towards some of the shorter term trading opportunities as they present themselves. Yeah. Um, there's been all these big headline events in the papers. We've had um, the US elections been dominating, coronavirus, vaccine, uh, government stimulus. What do you think has been missed while we've all been looking at these headlines? What are some, what's, what, what has the market missed? Well, I think what happens during a, um, a shock or event is 
people get used to the current situation and extrapolate it for a long period of time. So we're actually in emergency settings uh, globally uh, on monetary policy and fiscal and the rate environment is incredibly low and everyone's extrapolating this out for a long period of time um, but this won't happen this is this is a shock and um, drawing a crisis normally it's a, a structural crisis you've got to deflate a bubble this is a shock event so everything's been put on hold but there is no uh, essential bubble to deflate so if you can get policy fiscal policy kicking things along, monetary holding up asset prices, and we can recover out of this, that base case everyone's factoring in now will be wrong. The, the low rate environment forever, um, that will be proven to be wrong and that will cause big shocks through the stock market. And we're starting to see a bit of a glimpse of that now as we move out of phase one, which is pandemic, phase two, recovery and return to normality. Um, we are in phase two, uh, if the vaccine is here, but everyone's caught in phase one still. So that transition will be quite painful for a lot of people. I was gonna ask you where value is because that's where we started our last conversation. You gave us a great answer, but I'm gonna flip it on its head and say, where, where don't you see value given you're talking about coming from phase one to phase two? Well, I guess it's anything to do with interest rate sensitivity um, and uh, high valuations. So again, we look to the tech sector as overvalued um, if the vaccine comes. I mean, it's all contingent on the vaccine because we're actually looking pretty terrible globally on the virus situation is accelerating uh, to the negative side. So X of vaccine, you'd be piling into that trade because policy will be have to meet that virus. But if that virus is contained, uh, policy will change. So tech sector looks overvalued. Um, I mean, that's a standout still. Um, prices could fall 30, 40% and I wouldn't be surprised um, if we go into this next phase. And a lot of those beneficiaries, as we mentioned earlier, of, of, the, of, of corona, the COVID, uh, the stay at home trade, so to speak, you know, people have, you, you can't put a multiple on this year's sales or this year's earnings. And, and we'd heed caution on that because they will not be able to comp these as people start to return to normal life. So although people have suggested structural change has happened a lot more rapidly, as we know in the past, things don't happen that quickly. And by human nature, we like to go back to what we know. So as soon as borders open up and as soon as people are able to dine out and travel again, you will see that in earnest. Yeah. Um, you know, it, we are in a situation where you're not able to get face to face with your investors, um, which is obviously disappointing. Um, this is the way that we're doing it um, in 2020. What's the message that the two of you have got uh, to, your, to your shareholders and investors in WAM Leaders? Well, I think the next 12, 18 months is incredibly exciting. I think uh, we're going to go into this recovery phase. This will be more our market, even though we've actually performed well in a, you know, this very dislocated market. Um, we're very excited about the, you know, the good companies coming back to decent valuations from the depressed levels they are now. And we think we can position the portfolio incredibly well over the next period um, as it plays out. So we're, we're very excited about the opportunities, very excited about um, some of the companies that we can still purchase at um, discounts uh, to what we think they were. So um, this environment is great for us. And, and lastly, it's, we're living through history and it's exciting times to, 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 to take note of how people react, how markets are moving, because we'll be reading about this in 20 years and look back and go, okay, this is what happened. So mm. it's just a great time. We've just got to stay glued to markets and, and enjoy, enjoy the ride. All right. Well, thank you both for your time. Thank you. Thank you.